a young Romeo thwarted by love, a drastic move to a new world, and a mysterious death with plans for the afterlife. We've had modern day Job stories before, but this time we get up close and personal with history as we film on location sharing the extraordinary testimony of a struggling poet who devoted his life to serving God and his fellow man. More than that, today you get two stories for the price of one as a woman's song ministry is pleased to present our very first special missions edition where I preface today's story with an introduction to a special mission I've been blessed to witness that you have the opportunity to become a part of as God places it upon your heart. So why should I get involved you may be asking me? V, can't you leave well enough alone? And the answer to that is a resounding, no, I can't. Jesus himself, when referencing the sheep and the goats, the saved and the unsaved, calls us to feed the hungry, to quench the thirst of those who are parched, to take in the stranger, and to clothe the naked, and to visit the sick and those imprisoned. And today that could very well mean providing food and supplies, sponsorship, prayers and ministry, and friendship to those who are physically, mentally, or spiritually sick and imprisoned, or to the men and women working on the front lines with them. You know, I wish that I could just reach through the screen, take your hand and say, let's step up together for there's precious work to be done for God's kingdom. But since I can't be there in person with you, we must join together in spirit and in truth. And while you let God speak to your heart, please sit back and enjoy the testimony of a hard-working missionary in a third world country and the beautiful story behind our beloved hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, coming up next. This is my friend, J. Jake Sanchez Callum a 29-year-old Seventh-day Adventist missionary and one of the sweetest souls I've ever met. He lives, studies, and works all the way over in Cagayan de Oro in the Philippines. Though it appears that he lives in a tropical paradise, the Philippines is considered a third world country as it is a developing country with a high infant mortality rate, limited access to health care, and a low GDP per capita. Jay managed to work hard to build his own house, which consists of his bedroom and an outdoor area for his kitchen and where his guests sit on the balcony. He pays his neighbor to use their outdoor washroom, or comfort room as they call it, their water, and enough electricity to power a light bulb and charge his phone. Jay typically begins his day with his morning worship, followed by a 10 to 12 kilometer run for exercise. He used to spend a lot more time working, either teaching lawn tennis or giving therapeutic massages, but he has a lot less time on his hands as he is now enrolled in theology, studying online, using only an older phone with poor signal, slow downloading and uploading speeds, and a cracked screen. His only transportation is an older motorcycle, and though he runs into trouble with it here and there, it doesn't stop Jay from spreading the gospel, running church errands, and visiting and encouraging those who are absent from church. Jay's small balcony has hosted numerous Bible studies for the neighborhood children. Ang hinlo ug unsa pud ni hugaw dayon atong maklasify kung asa na bilong ang baboy, baka, pero kanding. He has been known to give comfort and hope and Bible studies to those who have felt broken and lost, even in the comfort of their own home, even sometimes by the light of one candle. It has been Jay's pleasure to distribute much needed food in the area and share what he can even from his own food. 
He enjoys cooking and is often seen in the kitchen cooking for those who come to the youth gatherings and various crusades he is regularly involved in, even though he doesn't always know where his next meal is coming from, as he has very little time to work outside of his studies and volunteer missionary duties. Uh, this is our brethren, all Seventh-day Adventists here in Mindanao. So we will go outside to reach uh, our brothers and sisters who are live still in the darkness. So we are going to visit them uh, house to house. Jay is unselfish and passionately active in his community, often canvassing the neighborhoods in preparation for the Crusades, praising God in public. <laughs> sharing the gospel at the Crusades. And his personal joy helping out with the many baptisms that come from them. Jay has often been so involved with his missionary work that he will spend the night sleeping at the church itself. He is one of the busiest men I know and yet he is still studying and working here and there to try to cover his costs of living and maintain his grades with the intention of serving God wherever he leads and winning souls for God's kingdom. God has blessed Jay in many ways, and it has been my pleasure to share in those joys. But I've also been humbled to witness the struggles he faces, often with things that we here in North America take for granted. And just recently, he even had to travel 10 hours overnight to attend his school to write an examination. Without the money for a hotel, he slept where else but in God's house. All in all, it's an amazing story that God has placed upon my heart to share with you in hopes that we can be the good stewards that God has called us to be and send him some money to help sponsor him in this godly quest to win souls and to pray for him. Just one Canadian dollar is equal to almost 42 Philippine pesos and it's estimated that for Jay to cover his food, gas, electricity, water, phone, and internet is at the very least 5,000 pesos a month or 119 Canadian dollars. He is also in need of a comfort room for himself and all his guests that he opens his home to and does Bible studies with, which is at least 15,000 pesos or around 360 Canadian dollars. He requires a new phone for his schooling, which is at least 7,000 pesos or 167 Canadian dollars. The region is very poor, and any additional monies would be used for distributing food and other necessities for the community and assisting the local church in their crusades. And if you're watching this from the United States, any money that you donate would go even further. As the Philippines is a third world country, bank accounts are relatively rare and Jay doesn't have one. 
However, he has agreed to allow a woman's song ministry to partner up with him to collect donations on behalf of him and his local ministry team. Donations can be made online using your credit or debit card or your PayPal account. The link is in the description below and it will also be posted on a Woman's Song Ministries Facebook page. For those of you who have a second device, you can scan this QR code to take you directly to our special donations page, giving you options to make the transaction quickly and easily. All donations will be processed by a Woman's Song Ministry and sent on a weekly basis to Jay via Western Union. And we so look forward to bringing you an update on how he and the ministry are doing. Your gift and your prayers could make all the difference to Jay, the ministry team, and those precious souls in the Philippines. And we sincerely thank you for partnering up with us to help win souls for God's kingdom and for supporting Jay in providing this vital ministry. One, two, three, go. Amen. So, mauna siya ato na satan. So, dadang salamat na nga po sa kanan. Ayan. Ayan po, hindi palakpak. And you know, what I love about today's story behind the hymn is that it also deals with a man who gave so much of himself to minister to others, just like Jay. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful work you are doing in the Philippines and thank you for blessing Jay's efforts that he dedicates so lovingly to you. Please continue to strengthen him, lead him, guide him, protect him, and provide for him. Thank you for allowing me to share Jay's story with so many people. And please bless all the viewers. Cover them with your feathers, Lord, and under your wings may they find refuge. Please speak to their hearts about how they can make a difference in this special mission. And thank you for always hearing our prayers. We pray this together in Jesus' precious name. Amen. While in transit, Patrick was again taken prisoner. She sang and praised and worshipped, and this is what she did all night long. Let the house go as he clung to his children. I am rich enough. Oh, I just love that. <laughs> I just love that. He too wanted to learn to live suffer and to conquer as Christ had. Joseph Medlicott Scriven was an Irish poet, tutor, non-denominational Christian and humanitarian back in the 1800s. He was born September 10, 1819 at the Ballymoney Lodge in Banbridge, Ireland to Captain John Scriven of the Royal Marines and Jane Medlicott, sister of the vicar in Wiltshire. His father John was also a church warden for two years and was one of the men of the church chosen to build a bridge across the River Ban in 1838 for a more convenient route to and from the St. Patrick Parish. Now at the age of 16, Joseph began attending Trinity College in Dublin, but in 1837, only two years later, he left to join the army. Joseph attended the Addiscombe Military College, where he was trained as a cadet with the intention of entering into the East India Company. And I was actually really intrigued by this because as a teenager, I had learned about the East India Company in a book of historical fiction, which is one of my favorite stories to this day. In any case, after two years, Joseph was forced to leave the military college after a number of health issues rendered him unfit to serve in a tropical environment. It was a great disappointment to his father, but Joseph went back to Trinity College and in 1842 graduated with a BA and he began tutoring families across Ireland. Now, almost immediately, Joseph fell in love with a young lady from Banbridge, and the two were engaged, planning for their wedding to be in the summer of 1843. 
The time for the wedding arrived after much happy anticipation, and on the eve before the ceremony was to take place, arrangements were made for the bride and groom to meet up one more time before the big day. Joseph made his way to the river ban and saw his sweetheart riding her horse across the ban bridge, the very same bridge that his father had helped to build. When suddenly, tragedy struck. No one knows what spooked the horse, but something did, for suddenly it reared, knocking her from the saddle, and she was thrown from the horse, hitting her head, rendering her unconscious before landing in the unforgiving waters of the Ban River. She was too far away for Joseph to do anything but watch in shock and horror as a few men pulled her lifeless body out of the river, for she had drowned within minutes. And Joseph was left reeling from the incident. He was so heartbroken that everywhere he looked, the Irish countryside reminded him of his beloved bride that he would never see again. And the change in Joseph was dramatic. Descriptions of it remind me of the Christian fiction book The Shack, when a father describes his sadness after the kidnapping and murder of his daughter as the great sadness that settled over him, or of Christian's great burden in Pilgrim's Progress. Both accurately described Joseph's feelings. He grew quiet and rarely smiled as the depression settled on him like a heavy weight. Joseph decided he needed a change, and he found it in the Plymouth Brethren, a group of believers who were nonconformists and did not regard rituals and sacraments as important, and even gave very little attention to the authority figures within the church. They believed that the Bible was the one and only authority, and considered themselves free churches and not necessarily any particular denomination. This became a bone of contention between Joseph and his family, who were devout Anglicans. But it brought peace to Joseph, and it softened his outlook on life. But it wasn't enough. Everywhere he looked, still he was reminded of his lost love, and he decided he needed more than a change. He needed an escape. So Joseph's grandfather had spent some time in Quebec and had died there in 1782. His father, John, had served in Canada during the War of 1812, so it seemed fitting to Joseph to go to Canada for a much-needed diversion. And after informing his family of his plans, his mother bought him a nice, big, heavy coat that would protect him in the harsh Canadian climate, only to discover that before he left, he had given the coat to a poor man in Ireland who, he said, needed the coat more than he did. And such was the heart of Joseph Scriven. On May 9, 1845, Joseph set sail from Dublin aboard the Perseverance and arrived in Montreal three weeks later. He found his way to Woodstock, Ontario, where he stayed with the Courtney's, members of the Plymouth Brethren he had met in Dublin, which gives us a little glimpse as to where the inspiration for the trip to Canada may have actually come from. Within two months, however, Although it was the middle of the summer, Joseph became quite ill, and not wanting to burden his friends, he sold all of his belongings and purchased a ticket home to Ireland. Once in his native land, he found work tutoring the children of Dr. Bartley, the official surgeon to the 1st Royal Dragoons, a heavy cavalry regiment of the British Army. Now, with the job came an amazing opportunity for Joseph when he was invited to accompany the family on a trip to the Middle East. Now, Joseph readily agreed and was deeply moved when he found himself walking in Damascus on the street called Straight, where Paul had been converted. And though there's no record of what message he had received, Joseph felt that God had spoken to him there as well, which was truly his first glimmer of hope since losing his precious love. It would not be the last, for it was soon after that Joseph relocated to Plymouth, England, where he developed a very close relationship with a young lady named Miss Falconer, who was related to Joseph's friends in Canada. Well, Joseph's happiness was cut short, though, when another man came on the scene with a proposal of marriage for Miss Falconer. Graciously, Joseph stepped aside, and Miss Falconer and her new suitor partnered up, leaving Joseph as the third wheel. But Joseph was far from bitter. He remained good friends with the couple, and together, in 1847, the three journeyed to Canada and joined the British settlement again in Woodstock, Ontario. Miss Falconer and her suitor married, but sadly, within months, mental illness struck the husband and life became a series of difficult trials. 
Joseph, however, remained a true friend to the pair throughout the difficulties. Joseph supported himself as a tutor, but his religious convictions were so strong that he gave nearly all of his income to those who were less fortunate. An old woman who knew him quite well was quoted as saying, I never knew of another person who was so consistent as a Christian. Oh, if only people were actively saying that about us. Well, within a few years, Joseph moved east and began tutoring the children of Robert Lamport Pengelly, a retired captain from the British Royal Navy, who had been given a tract of land in nearby Boothley, Ontario, when he was honored for his service. Well, Joseph, upon meeting Mrs. Pengelly's niece, Eliza Catherine Roche, fell deeply in love with her. And Catherine, for she went by her middle name, agreed to marry him. As they planned their wedding, Joseph shared his deep faith with her and she chose to become baptized into the Plymouth Brethren immediately. So passionate and determined was she that although it was only April and just the start of our Canadian spring, she was baptized by full immersion in the frigid waters of Rice Lake. Catherine was chilled so badly that she developed pneumonia and though Joseph tried desperately to find different treatments that would save her, tragically on August 6, 1860, before Joseph could marry the love of his life, Catherine died. Well, the loss was almost more than Joseph could handle and after she was buried in the private Pengeli Cemetery, Joseph had her father vow to bury him next to her. Joseph took some time to stay with his friend, James Sackville, who was also one of the Plymouth Brethren. Though there are conflicting reports as to the exact location where this occurred, it's widely believed that it was while he was there he received word that his mother was facing a health crisis back home. Well, Joseph, already in the depths of despair after losing the love of his life and now feeling helpless to aid his mother in her time of need, he cried out to God one night and felt his burden lift so dramatically that he wrote a poem called Pray Without Ceasing, and he sent the loving words of encouragement to his mother. When she received his letter, her eyes and heart took in his poem, which just so happened to be the verses of what we know as what a friend we have in Jesus. Getting back to Joseph, his grief lay heavily upon him on a daily basis, and he poured himself into his ministry and charity work to escape it. He rented a room at 54 Thomas Street in Port Hope, and here's where things get exciting because Port Hope and Boothley, Ontario are only a couple of hours away from me, so I decided to drive there and give you a first-hand look at the various locations of her story. Well, it became Joseph's custom to spend the winter months living in Boothley and the summer months in Port Hope, boarding with the widowed Margaret Gibson, whose late husband had been a milkman. While he was there, Joseph helped the widow milk her cow and carry on her husband's dairy business. And though I found the location of where Joseph stayed, the house itself had been demolished in 1987 due to, of all things, contamination from radioactive waste. Now apparently radium and uranium from El Dorado mining and refining had contaminated some of the land in Port Hope between 1933 and 1953. The lot had laid empty for some time after that, but as I wandered the streets with my GPS in hand looking for the exact location, I realized it was the lot that was now cordoned off and under development. Joseph became well known throughout Port Hope in Boothley, Ontario for cutting firewood for widows, the handicapped, and the sick. Now, at one point, someone saw him working hard cutting wood and expressed interest in hiring him, but he insisted on only working for those who could not afford to pay him. He often gave his clothing and money to those in need, and it was said that when he wasn't voluntarily serving others, he was preaching to them on the streets of Port Hope. Multiple times he was bullied by passers-by throwing mud at him and slurs, and even other times he was beaten so badly that he'd be left lying in the ditch unable to move for hours. People saw his preaching as a nuisance, and not only was a complaint written about him in the local paper, but he was actually arrested for preaching on the streets and released on a promise to appear in court. Well, through it all, Joseph kept his cool and his dignity. 
More than that, he kept his humility, even refusing to have his photo taken, as the Plymouth Brethren found that to be vain. The only pictures shared of him come from his great nephew, who's not quite sure but believes it is him, and compared with a sketch that was done of him later in life by Dora Holdaway, it appears to be the same person. Meanwhile, back at home, his mother shared Joseph's poem, Pray Without Ceasing, with a friend, and in 1865, Horace L. Hastings published it anonymously in his hymnal, Social Hymns, Original and Selected, and it found almost instant success. Now, a story that many biographies seem to miss is one that took place around 1875. One snowy night, as Joseph was driving a horse-drawn sleigh with a lantern hung to light his way, his horse suddenly stopped short, startled by a small figure lying unconscious in the snow. Joseph immediately picked the child up, and not knowing where he belonged, he took him home, staying up most of the night to nurse the child's frostbitten foot. And in the morning, Joseph learned it was seven-year-old David S. Kidd, one of nine children who lived with his father in a single-room log cabin. Apparently, the previous night, his father had come home intoxicated, complaining about all the mouths he had to feed and the lack of space in their home, and allegedly he beat the child and sent him and his brother out for firewood. His brother returned to the house, but David ran away into the snowy night, but had been overcome with the cold and fainted. Though he had to walk with a cane for the rest of his life, Joseph's care saved the child's foot and life that night, and he would go on to speak to David's father, who agreed that David could live with Joseph. Well, Joseph brought him up in the church, and David attended school and went on to attend the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, and later become a reverend. But he would achieve notoriety in adulthood with an unbelievable story that includes reading the Bible aloud in saloons, being adopted as an adult, and questionable practices as a reverend, as well as pursuing a big fortune. Getting back to Joseph, by the time he was in his 60s, he was physically and emotionally depleted. And so he was invited to again stay with his friend James Sackville, who cared for him during his now frequent illnesses. While searching in a drawer for something Joseph asked him for, James found the lyrics of Pray Without Ceasing and marveled at them, taking them to Joseph and asking how he had written something so beautiful. Well, Joseph's reply was simple, the Lord and I did it between us. Though he was an avid writer of religious poetry, and he was known to share them with anyone who would take a copy, even publishing hymns and other sacred verses in Peterborough in 1869, he had omitted Pray Without Ceasing because this poem was different, it was more personal, and he was quite adamant that it had been meant for his mother, and that it had not been meant to be seen by anyone else, for by this time he was aware that it had indeed been published. Sadly, on the night of October 10th, 1886, while Joseph was seriously ill with fever, he and James talked until midnight, at which time James went to bed. When he awoke the next morning, Joseph was not in his bed, and upon searching the grounds, James found him at the mill close to his house, having fallen into the six to seven foot deep sluice where the water came out, drowned. He was 67 years old. Now, though there had been no inquest at the time, his death was shrouded by mystery. To this day, there is speculation as to whether the death was accidental, from Joseph wandering carelessly in a fever-induced state, if it was suicide, as he had suffered with severe depression for years, and now his body was afflicted as well, or something more sinister. It was pointed out in hushed tones that Joseph may have been euthanized by well-meaning friends, as all evidence indicated that Joseph was far too ill to even get out of bed by himself. More than that, there is a school of belief among many of the fine people of Port Hope and Boodley that Joseph was actually murdered by none other than David Kidd himself. Now, to me, this was the most surprising theory of all, as he had every reason to be grateful and love Joseph Scriven like a son would love his father. But David Kidd was not the average son. Strangely, he would refer to himself as doctor without any evidence that he actually was a doctor, and nor was there ever any actual evidence that he had ever attended Moody Bible Institute. It has even been suggested that he had schizophrenia and that none of these fantastic stories that he told were actually true. 
He had, however, befriended a rich family from Australia and had been adopted by them as an adult and included in their will, but shortly after, they died before they could journey over to meet him. And when the rest of the family died, he adopted their last name of Byrne and pursued their fortune for years, not very becoming for a man of the cloth. His unusually high-pitched voice, his handicapped foot, and his inconsistency in regards to God and money sure paint the situation into a different picture, and it's speculated that he killed Joseph Scriven for the small amount of money that he possessed. Who knew that such an unassuming man as Joseph Scriven could have his death shrouded by such mystery? To the best of my understanding, it appears that it is accepted for the most part as an accidental death, as that's what's on the record. But think about it. His strong Christian beliefs would rule out suicide or euthanasia as options. But I have to admit, after what happened to his first love and his last love, it's very coincidental that his cause of death would also be from the water like theirs were. The bridge near where his body was found still exists today, but the wooden one was replaced by concrete in the same style. Behind the bridge and up a small hill, a white house stands, which is a private residence now, but used to be a church that James Sackville had built on the property and held Plymouth Brethren meetings in. The mill has long since been destroyed, it's believed by fire. Lovingly, Joseph was buried in what was the private Pengeli family cemetery, laid head to head, foot to foot with his fiancée Catherine, the fulfillment of the promise made by Mr. Pengeli to Joseph years earlier. It had been Joseph's wish that, when the resurrection came at the second coming of Christ, that they would rise from the graves and see each other in the first moment of the resurrection. In one of the most charming scenes I have ever witnessed in a cemetery, there in the ground lay two markers, one with Joseph Scriven's name on it and the other reading Scriven's Sweetheart. Much later, a large gravestone was placed at the site of the grave with his name and the lyrics to What a Friend We Have in Jesus engraved on it. And you know, I can relate to the plan that Joseph had for the resurrection. When my ex-husband died, he was cremated and I spread his ashes on my stepson's grave for the exact same reason. Nothing could be a more beautiful thought or a more fitting location than that. And God placed that dream upon my heart. And I felt so satisfied and so honored to be able to be a part of their joy upon Resurrection Day. I can't wait. It's unsure exactly of how Pray Without Ceasing was published in North America, but it was sometime in the late 1880s after James Sackville discovered the poem in a drawer that Joseph actually received full credit for it. Though to most of us, it's one of the most beautiful and well-known hymns of all time, it was not always as popular. The handbook to the Lutheran hymnal states, in spite of the fact that this hymn, with its tune, has been criticized as being too much on the order of the sentimental gospel type, its popularity remains strong and the hymn retains a place in modern hymnals. Okay, so what kind of Christian criticizes a hymn for being too sentimental when speaking of Jesus, can you imagine? As for the melody that we so love, it was composed by Charles Crozat Converse. He was born October 7, 1832 in Warren, Massachusetts, and after attending school in Elmira, New York, he traveled to Leipzig, Germany, and there studied music. He returned to the United States in 1857, studied law and philosophy, and upon graduation worked as an attorney in Erie, Pennsylvania. But he never gave up on his music, and he composed for string quartets, chorals, and cantatas under multiple pseudonyms. He had a love for the church, and in 1868 composed the music specifically for Joseph Scriven's hymn, and it was he who changed the title to What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Now, for those of you who love random facts other than music and law, the other thing that Charles Converse is remembered for is his attempt to coin the term thon as a gender-neutral pronoun for the sake of basic conversation and presumably legal documentation. But not to be confused with the gender neutrality that we say today, uh-uh. Charles lived a long life and died in his home in New Jersey in 1918 at the age of 84. 
I don't think I have to tell you how deeply inspirational what a friend we have in Jesus has been over the years. That's no surprise. What was a surprise to me was the fact that there have been parodies made of it. So sadly, someone took the melody and wrote new lyrics, When This Lousy War Is Over, a British song about the Great War with lyrics that disrespect the authority figure and tell him where he can shove his weekend passes. Alan Price also took liberties with the song by placing the tune to his own lyrics about changes in life and how love, well, it inevitably turns to sorrow. In the 1980s, Volkswagen featured that song, Changes, in a commercial portraying a woman leaving her husband and getting rid of her jewelry and getting rid of her fur coat, but keeping the car, of course. And finally, the anime series Taisho Otome Fairy Tale took the tune and wrote lyrics that, when translated, reference a confused shadow as being a form of hope. So, though the enemy will never miss a chance to disrespect and undermine what's meant to praise God, God's got this. He is greater and the hymn has influenced far more people worldwide over a number of generations than all of the parodies put together. So though it's unfortunate that the song has been disrespected, just remember, God is on the throne and he has the victory. What a Friend We Have in Jesus has been covered by so many amazing artists and is a particular favorite in the country music community, sung by Glenn Campbell, Alan Jackson, Alabama, Merle Haggard, Kenny Rogers, Guy Penrod, Willie Nelson, Brad Paisley, Dolly Parton, and more. It was also covered by Ike and Tina Turner, Ella Fitzgerald, Bing Crosby, and the list goes on and on. My top three renditions include Amy Grant's medley of What a Friend We Have in Jesus, Leaning into the Old Rugged Cross, and How Great Thou Art, a combination you don't want to miss. The Celtic worship version features the vocals of Steph McLeod combining almost a Celtic bluegrass mashup with a stunning cinematography. And my favorite version is another sweet, soulful cover by none other than Aretha Franklin. The links are in the description below. I hope you enjoy them as much as I did. My name is Veronica, and thank you for joining me on this heartwarming journey back to the 1800s. You know, as tragic and beautiful as his story is, I feel like I can relate to Joseph Scriven as well, with three major strikes in my love department, with my first marriage ending in violence, my second husband spiraling into mental health issues, addictions, and death after the loss of my stepson, and the third significant relationship following that, which had me tumbling down the rabbit hole with an alcoholic and what I was to learn was a textbook narcissist who had no idea how to love and he didn't care to learn. These stories, like Joseph's, so painful, would remain tragedies, but for God's grace and mercy. One of the things I love about God is that he creates such beauty from the messes we make or find ourselves in. Like a tapestry, our lives are a mess of knots and sideways stitches and dangling threads. But he takes all those things, the victories and the failures, the beautiful moments and the heartaches, and he gathers them, weaving them together to create a perfect testimony that is all your own to share and encourage others. A masterpiece that he lovingly sees us through, just him and us. Because with Christ, it's never my story, but our story, and he uses it to bless others if we'll come out of our shell and share it. It's my prayer that instead of feeling sorry for ourselves, or instead of being slaves to our shame or our failures, that we look at Joseph Scriven's story and realize that God will never leave you in a rut. He'll never leave you in your brokenness. Rather, if you surrender it to him, that he is faithful and will not only carry you through your difficulties, but he will reveal a tremendous blessing, added strength, and bring beauty from it that will also bless others just as he did with Joseph Scriven and just as he is doing with our missionary, J. Jake Sanchez Callum, in our special missions edition. Maybe you're asking yourself, why should I get involved with his ministry? I'll let Jesus answer the question for you. He says in Matthew 25 verse 40, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. 
Jay is living these words on the front lines of a third world country. And if you can't be there working beside him, will you at least send him some support and prayer? If you enjoyed this video, it's not enough to keep it to yourself. Share, share, share with family and friends, church members, and even strangers visiting your timeline. You never know who needs a message of hope or who needs to be comforted in their trials or who needs to have the passion of their first love, Christ, reignited. Please consider subscribing and becoming a part of our community here and don't forget to turn notifications on so you'll know the next time I release a new video. Maybe I'll be covering your favorite hymn. Until then, may God bless you and keep you. Bye bye now. A Woman's Song Ministry would like to say an extra special thank you to Lori Stevenson Britton of the Port Hope Public Library. Not only did she unlock her local history room, but she dug through files, made some photocopies for me, and she was also there for me well after I had returned home through email to answer questions and send me more files. Without your help, this movie would not be the same. Thank you so much. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry. Everything to God in prayer.